So now we're actually going to start delivering some stuff. So I've decided to use Heroku as the uh, vendor of choice for doing the deployment today. Together with Heroku, we're going to do a CI CD deployment pipeline with GitHub Actions. So the first step is to just create a profile on Heroku and then we start provisioning the application. So of course, the elephant in the room. Does it cost money? And the answer is yes. It, it, this is not a free service. Free web services for deployments, they are kind of disappearing from the web. And this is as close to free as you can get. The way the pricing works is that you're paying per hour and you're paying $0.01 per hour. If you keep this running 24 hours a day in one month, it's going to be $7. So it's still very cheap. And the good thing about the hourly price is that you can just turn on the application when you want to test some things or you want to have it running for a customer or something, and then you can just shut it down again. So even if you're using it for a couple of hours one day and a couple of hours another day, you're not losing your provisioning. You're basically just toggling on and off whether it's running or not. Once you are signed in, you should have this overview of your current applications. Click the new button and now click create new app. I'll just call mine WebSocket API and now pick uh, Europe or wherever you are and click create app. When you provision applications on Heroku, by default, Heroku doesn't actually know what kind of software is this. So we need to provision a .NET application. Therefore, we must also have the .NET runtime installed. If you go to the settings route on the page for the application, you can also just use the tab bar in the top. Then you can find this build pack section. This is where we actually configure what must be installed by default. They offer some predefined build packs here, but the one that I want to use uh, is actually just this GitHub link here. Um, so I'm going to paste the GitHub link in the bio of the video, and then you can just copy it from there, and then you paste it in here. So the next time you do a deployment, it automatically knows, okay, we are going to use this build pack, and then we're going to have .NET runtime installed. So the pipeline can actually be really short. In fact, the only thing we need to do is we need to check out the repository, set up .NET SDK in order to actually build the program, and then instead of doing a .NET run or a .NET test command, we use the .NET publish. And the C here is just to make it a release configuration. So there is a slight difference between running a program or compiling it such that it's ready to be released. And then the O here just means output. So it means what folder do we output it to? So we output it to a folder called publish. The remainder of the pipeline here is just to target a pre-existing action. So there exists a repository on GitHub, which is this repository here. We notified here that there exists a GitHub action that this repository is responsible for. So if we go to the marketplace here, you can see that this is the action. It's called deploy to Heroku, which means that if you take the name here of the repository and then the version here, you can use this inside of your pipeline. And now we just need to configure our values. So the first value is the API key. Then there is the application name and the email that you use. We're going to say false to the use Docker variable here. This is if you want to use a container for the deployment. Uh, we we'll just say no to that. And then, of course, the app directory. You could also configure an environment variable for that. And uh, then this would be very copy friendly. Um, but this is a hard coded uh, value right here. And then the environment. There is something special about this environment. And that is you have to name your environment variable HD for Heroku deployment and then underscore and then whatever you want to call the environment variable. So we have an environment variable for Azure Cognitive Services. That's why we inject the environment variable here. On the remote repository, just go into your secrets and variables, go into actions, and now we must configure these variables here. So how do you find these variables? Well, this is the Heroku email you signed up with. This is the name that we picked. So in my case, it was WebSocket API. And then there is this API key. I'm going to show you where you can find it. Click on the uh, account up here. Go to account settings, scroll down, and now you have your API key here. 
you need to reveal the API key and then you can just copy it in. Currently, we're always serving on port 8181, but uh, it's probably not the port that Heroku wants you to serve your application on. So how do you know what port to serve on? Well, they give you an environment variable for this. So you can just create a variable called port and then just go to the environment, get environment variable, and then capitalize port. Um, and since you don't have this locally, what you can do is you can use the null coalescing operator to say, if this here is null, uh, then go with 8181 and then just um, concatenate the port here. So now this in local development will still be 8181, so we're not breaking anything. And uh, this one right here will now be whatever port we are being assigned by Heroku. Since the uh, web API itself can also take up a port and you want to make sure that you're not trying to take up the same port as the WebSocket API, you can, ex you can explicitly state inside of your program CS which port to use for the web API. So we're going to access the web host here and then use the method called use URLs and then just add in a different port here. So the protocol, uh, wildcard, and now just put in a number here. And uh, here in the top, I'm actually going to make sure that the web API actually explicitly starts because this console that read line is fine for local development, but you probably shouldn't use it in production. So I'll just collapse uh, the WebSocket configuration here and now just return the web application here and change the uh, return type here to web application. In the main method, say var app equals startup and then app.run. So th this is a configuration you could use in production. You can also use it in local development, but it was easier just doing a console read line beforehand. Have your changes inside of a different branch or something, uh, get them into whatever branch that you want to deploy from and then run the workflow now. So when you actually deploy your application from the pipeline and it successfully has completed the pipeline, you should go to the log section here and then check that everything actually works. So the default logger in .NET outputs that it is serving the API on some port and then flag outputs this line here. So the port that we allocated using the uh, environment variable called port was actually set to this value. We had no way of knowing beforehand, that's why we used an environment variable. So we actually want to start sending some requests to the application from Postman. But the exact route that you need to direct your requests to might not actually be immediately obvious. You need to click on the open app here and then we will get to this application error page. This is just because we don't have a default HTTP response when we go to this address here. But this is actually the address that the application is serving on. So it should be the name of your application and then it should be some hash code .com. So if you take that address and you put it inside of the address bar of a WebSocket uh, request here on uh, Postman. What you do is you remove HTTPS and then you write WSS. So this is the WebSocket and then the last S stands for secure. So it's just like HTTPS. And now if you click on connect here, you should get a green indicator to see that you are successfully connected to the API. So let's uh, test that all of the messages have the exact same outcome that we expect them to. First of all, we want to authenticate. We can see that it works. We get the uh, welcome back here. Uh, then we get the uh, enter room, which is successful. And then we had this message here where we try to trigger the content filter on Azure Cognitive Services. And we see that it works. And if we change the message to something that is not considered to be uh, violent, it also works. Uh, so we have the expected outcome and we're doing it with the deployment. So you can also see in here, we get the exception here where we are saying that this message is not allowed. So there is a successful logging of the message as well as the expected outcome of the event. So now that we've concluded that the application works, uh, it's also important to conclude how to shut down the application again. Because this is why I say this is so cheap, is because you can go into resources here 
And if you've made a successful deployment, this is what you should be able to see. You should be able to see that it has some kind of default way of executing the program. And you should also see the dyno type here. So if you have a more expensive or if you have the eco dyno or whatever, you should be able to see here what you're actually paying for. And this is the price per hour. So you can click this pin here and then you can just toggle this off and then the, the application shuts down. And that means that now you're no longer being charged any amount per hour. So when you want to get back to testing the application or you want to deploy it to a customer or something, you just go in here and then you just toggle it on and now it runs again. Uh, so this is why it's actually cheap is because it's so easy to shut it down and turn it back on without having to reprovision anything or redeploy anything. So when you get around to actually start deploying this in practice, one thing you might find out is that most cloud vendors, they have some sort of limit to how long they keep connections alive by default. Uh, so on Heroku, when you have a WebSocket connection with the server, by default, it will be held open for 55 seconds if there is no activity, which means that if you want connections to stay alive for longer than 55 seconds, which presumably you do want, uh, you'll have to add in a ping mechanism. So here you might see a bunch of messages and they say ping. So in the beginning we connected and now every 30 seconds there is a ping, which means that we don't disconnect. So I'll just show you inside of the code really quick how you can implement this. So in the beginning of the configuration here, we basically just force the WebSocket connection to send a message every 30 seconds. Currently, this is just a string message. So you could have a class and then you could say new server pings client, and then you could turn that into a string and send it. So by default, a string is sufficient, but it depends on how you structure things in the client application. The important thing for keeping the connection alive is just there must be some continuous ping pong between the client and the server application. And if you don't implement this yourself, uh, if you have someone who enters a chat room, no one broadcasts anything within a 55 second time interval, uh, the connection will be lost. So even if you reconnect again, that will just be a new connection. So whatever data you associated with the connection will be lost. Uh, so this is a pretty vital thing to have when you get around to deployment. And I forgot to show you, I also have a little bit of the uh, ping configuration down here. If you just take this and you move it up where you have the rest of the configuration, uh, that will be uh, very sufficient. So now you have it in the same place. 